Okay, hi everyone, welcome back. Um, we had some really great conversations this morning and I'm really looking forward to the afternoon sessions. Our first speaker in ses session three is Saskia DeVries. Uh, she joined the Allen Institute in 2012 as a scientist on the neural coding team. She has a background in systems neuroscience and has studied visual processing in both vertebrate and invertebrate systems using a combination of physiological, computational, behavioral, and molecular tools. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to you. Great, thank you. Um, thank you for the introduction and for the invitation to speak. I've been really enjoying today's sessions and um, hearing from everybody about uh, different aspects of open data and some of the challenges that we face in, in sharing data and using open data. Uh, what I want to tell you about today um, is, let me see how this, there we go, um, is some of the work that we've been doing at the Allen Institute. Um, so for those of you who know about the Allen Institute for Brain Science, we are a nonprofit research institute. And our mission is to accelerate the understanding of the brain by creating public resources um, that we create through a big team science approach. Um, but then we make this data freely available to the community uh, that can, they can use then to accelerate their own research. And so over the last um, over you know decade plus, we've generated a number of different data sets that you can see many of them on this timeline. Um, and the one I'm going to tell you about is this one on the far right, the Allen Brain Observatory. And this is our first data set that is an in, in vivo physiology data set. A lot of our previous data sets were focused on things such as gene expression in different structures of the, the brain of the mouse or the human. Um, then we were moving into looking at um, data, looking at connectivity, the connections between different parts of the brain. But this was our first um, foray into collecting data in the you know, awake, alive animal um, and generating a, um, a, a data set with this. So I'm going to tell you about our two photon data sets. So two photon is a data collection uh, method where we use calcium indicators and we can use a two photon microscope to image the activity of large populations of neurons simultaneously. And we set out um, in creating this data set to create um, a survey of physiological activity throughout the mouse visual cortex. Um, as I mentioned, a lot of our, the previous data that the Institute has generated has been about um, gene expression or cell identity. And here we want to look at the activity of neurons so we can start asking questions about the computations that are going on in these um, neural circuits. And so we wanted to be able to survey across different areas, um, different structures in the brain. So this is an image of the mouse, the surface of the mouse cortex. This is our primary visual cortex surrounded by other visual areas. And so we um, collected data from about six different visual areas. We also collected data across a number of different cell types. And so we could use genetic tools that are available in the mouse to limit the expression of our calcium indicator um, to particular subtypes of cells that are expressed in particular areas or in say excitatory cells or inhibitory cells so that we could start to unravel different functions of these different types of cells. And then because we're interested in the computations and, and visual representation, we use a wide range of different visual stimuli so we can look at how stimulus statistics might affect some of these computations. So this is an example, um, we play this movie of, of what the data collection looks like. So I mentioned before, we're using a calcium indicator. And so this is um, a fluorescent indicator that um, whenever a cell fires a spike, calcium floods into the cell, it binds to the indicator, and then the cell fluoresces. And so you can see in this movie, this is the movie we collect through our microscope, um, there's probably a few hundred cells in this field of view and different cells light up at different times depending on what's being shown to the mouse or whether the mouse is running or, or things like that. So we're collecting this, this movie of calcium activity at the same time that we're showing um, different types of stimuli to the animal. I'll play that again. So sometimes it's noise, sometimes it's movies. Um, and so you can see the types of stimuli we show. We also track, um, this is the eye that's pointed at the monitor for the mouse. So we can track where that pupil is located. That's what this little red dot indicates, the, the times when the, the, move, the eye moves, um, as well as we have information about, say, the, whether the mouse runs or is stationary during the experiment. You can see here's a place where the mouse starts running. So this is what um, one session looks like 
We collect this through, um, I mentioned before, kind of a big team science approach. We have a standardized high throughput data collection pipeline uh, where each stage of our data collection is carried out by a dedicated team of technicians. Um, so for instance, generating our transgenic mice, um, then we have a team of surgeons that um, put a cranial window into the skull so that we have optical access to the cortex. Um, we can create a, um, we can use intrinsic signal imaging to create a map of where the different visual areas are so that we can target our data collection to um, the specific areas that we are looking to get data from. We spend some time habituating the, the mice to these experiments before we begin our data collection in our actual in vivo imaging um, team. And here we, from a given field of view where we've got a group of cells, we'll return to those same cells across many days, um, usually three days to collect our full stimulus set. Um, and then we'll collect as much data from a mouse as we can from different fields of view. Um, when we've finished collecting the data, the animal is euthanized and then we do serial imaging after uh, post hoc that allows us to reconstruct the volume of the brain that we can use to make sure that, for instance, the, the genetic tools that we had were expressing the indicator in the right population of cells and to make sure um, that the, the, the health of the brain was um, good quality. This standard pipeline enables us to collect a lot, a lot of data, but it also um, has the benefit that it allows us to establish um, and kind of enforce strict um, uh, quality control metrics. So at each stage of our pipeline, we've got um, we assess various metrics for making sure that the animals are healthy um, and that the data that we're collecting is, is good data that we can use. So this Sankey plot shows you the, the mice that have entered our pipeline and where they fail out of the pipeline for various reasons. And a lot of these have to do with animal health, um, but some of them have to do with kind of the data integrity. And so you see that there's more failures at our imaging stage than um, at other stages where um, issues with the microscope could um, cause, cause failures, maybe for just a single um, imaging session, which we can repeat. Um, but if there's too many of those types of failures for a given animal, then we'll remove that animal from our data set altogether. And so the result is after running this pipeline for about two years, we've collected over 1400 hours of imaging from 456 different uh, fields of view, different groups of cells. Um, and so this is obviously a large amount of data. Um, and you can think of these as all into separate movies, kind of like the movie that I showed you earlier. Um, and that's really exciting. Um, but for most of the ways that we want to work with this, with this data, the movies aren't what we want to work with. We want to think about what those individual cells are doing. And so we developed now an, um, an image processing pipeline that takes all of these pieces of data and extracts the information that we're looking for. So we, the biggest um, extraction involves our, the calcium movie where we want to identify the individual cells and extract the fluorescence traces for each of those cells to pull out the activity of all of the, the cells in, in a given field of view. And so we have a motion correction, cell segmentation, demixing algorithms that give us activity traces for each cell. You can see this plot. This is across the entire session, the activity of about 50 of the cells in one experiment. We use our information about the stimulus so that we know what stimulus is being presented when, and so that, that can be temporarily aligned with the activity. The um, information about the pupil location, where that pupil is pointed on the monitor, um, as well as the running activity of the mouse. And all of this gets integrated and we can bundle this data together into a single file. Um, and we use the NeuroData Without Borders file format, which is a standardized file format for this type of data um, that kind of makes it easier to, to share and, and use, um, use these data uh, across groups. Um, and so all of this information gets put into these, these NeuroData Without Borders file, uh, files. So this kind of summarizes the data that we've collected. Um, as you can see, um, in total, we've got over 63 recordings from over 63,000 neurons from 456 different populations. And so some analyses focus on individual neurons. Other analyses think about the interactions of these, these cells within a population. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the data is collected across lots of different um, cell types where we've limited our expression of our indicator to particular types of cells um, in the cortex. And we've collected data from six different cortical areas. Um, so you can see how that data is broken down here. And as we start to kind of dive into the cell, we see that there's lots of different things going on with these neurons. And these are visualizations that we have that I'm, I'm not going to unpack, but they summarize some of the responses that we see to the different stimuli that we show. 
Um, and you can just see that there's a lot of data here. We've got 63,000 cells, a lot of different stimulus responses, and there's a lot that can be done with this data. Because we make our data openly available, there's, there's, a, you know, we can do a lot of analysis of this, but this is really, we want this to be something that the, the community can use and does use. Um, and so this kind of brings me to this, the, the next stage where I want to talk about how do we effectively share this type of in vivo physiological data. So, um, and I want to talk about the, the different levels of data that we collect and, and that we use. Um, and so with the calcium imaging, we start by collecting these raw movies that I showed you earlier of, of that we're collecting through our microscope where we have lots and lots of cells that are lighting up at different times. Um, and these movies are, are really, they're, they're great to watch, but um, they're really big, right? It's about 60, uh, 60 gigabytes per movie. Um, and if you extend that across, you know, 1500 hours of imaging, um, that, that becomes a really large data set. And so some of our users might want these raw movies, um, but that's really hard for us to share because they're big files and they're kind of clunky. And then in addition to the movie, there's a lot of auxiliary data files that need to go with them that provide the synchronization information and the stimulus information. Those movies go through stages of processing that I mentioned before, where we identify um, the, which, where cells are located in the movie in order to extract the traces of activity for individual cells. Um, and we do other um, kind of annotation processes where we demix, like if there's cells that are overlapping, we can demix those signals to, to separate those out. We do our temporal alignment so that we can have all of the stimulus information integrated with the activity traces. And then we can also summarize these responses. We can compute metrics about receptive field sizes or tuning properties of, of these neurons. Um, and so when we think about what data we wanna share, we could go all the way from our raw data, these big kind of awkward files um, that require a lot of data processing before they're useful. We can go all the way down to these derived metrics, which are pretty easy to share. We could have a simple spreadsheet with 63,000 cells and we could compute hundreds of metrics for them. And that's very easy for us to, to post somewhere, to put in a repository, to, to email around. Um, but what really is the most effective and useful level for, for sharing this data? So there are some use cases for these derived metrics and visualizations. And as I mentioned, it's, it's in many ways the easiest data to share. Um, and in fact, on our website, this is pretty much what dominates the, the data that's, that we have available on our website. Um, and this will take you to the website for this particular data set. Um, this is from the landing page summarizing the data that we've collected, and we've got visualizations summarizing each experiment that was collected, so giving us kind of summaries of the populations that were recorded as in, in each session um, with summary statistics about, say, the eye position or the running speed of the mouse, as well as summaries of various um, response metrics that we can compute. We also have visualizations for individual neurons um, that provide tuning properties and derived um, responses for each of the 63,000 neurons. And you can dig into those individually and start to actually interact with this more um, and, and get a better sense for how individual cells are uh, responding to the different stimuli we show. Um, this is really useful for exploring the data set and understanding the, the data that's available and sometimes for maybe identifying a particular session or a particular cell that you want to focus on for your analysis. But in terms of doing actual rigorous analysis, this isn't really the, the, the tool that most people want to engage with. Um, and so where most of our users actually want to work with the data is with these time aligned activity traces. Um, that we have packaged in these NWB files. And so this is where the software kit that we have, the Allen SDK provides programmatic access to these data that enables users to download the data. Um, it keeps the data organized and then it allows them to access all of the contents of our NWB files. And then it has some functions to kind of begin um, anal analyzing the data that people can build off for their own direction, in their own directions. Um, but there are some people who do actually want to use those raw movies. Um, and part of that is because a lot of the processing that we do moving from raw data to derived metrics is still an area of, of open research. And I think this is maybe something that's different for different modalities of data that are being shared, where the community has different uh, 
different ways of doing segmentation or doing demixing. Um, and we don't yet have a consensus as to what the, the best or the, the, um, the, the right way to do it is. And so there are people who are working on those questions where access to those raw movies is more useful than access to these derived traces. And so for that, we've actually put um, all of our raw movies onto AWS. It's a public data set on AWS. Um, so there's something like 82,000 terabytes of, of these movies available there. But because they're so large, we needed to partner with them to make that really easily accessible. But regardless of the level of, of data that people want to interact with, um, one of the key things that I think is most important to point out is the need for, for documentation. Um, so we have a platform paper that describes our data set and some of the analyses that we've done with it. Um, and this is a standard scientific paper, and it focuses on the scientific results. Um, but the, the information in this paper is not really sufficient for people to really access and use the data effectively. I um, mean, this is something that one of our um, speakers this morning kind of touched upon. And so in addition to our platform paper, we've got white papers up through our website that document how the data was collected and processed, what the transgenic tools are, um, how we, we processed the data and analyzed it, um, that really enables users to better understand what the data is and how they can use it, um, as well as tutorials that we have that, that show how how to use the SDK to access each of the pieces of data um, so that, that they're able to, to actually work with it. Um, this is much more detailed than the methods that you'll find in our scientific paper. Um, even after, you know, like there's the methods we submitted and then the methods that were published and, you know, what users actually need in, is, is a lot more than either of those. But in the few years that this has been available, there have been about two dozen papers, some of them from um, from within the Institute, but others from outside of the Institute that people have used this data. And again, at different levels, right? Some of these papers look at questions of segmentation, whereas others are looking at questions of, of stimulus coding um, in this data set. So to wrap up, I've gone a little over time. I apologize for that. Um, I, I want to just mention in the last year, we've released a second data set that um, kind of parallels our pipeline where before we've been using this calcium imaging, these now use um, high density neuropixel electrodes where we have six um, high density electrodes that um, record spike time precision um, data from both cortical and subcortical areas. And so we use the same stimulus and the same pipeline, um, but now we've got better temporal resolution and, and access to different areas. So all of this data is available and I've already mentioned um, uh, our website with our links for the software kit and the documentation. We've got a forum where people who are using this data can um, ask questions when they run into trouble. Um, and with that, I want to thank you for your attention. I want to also recognize the founder of our institute, Paul Allen, for his vision, encouragement, and support in generating these large open um, data sets, as well as all of my team members who um, have contributed to this data. So thank you. Great, thank you so much, Saskia. Um, if anybody has questions, please send them to me in the chat, but I actually have a question. Um, my background is in neuroscience and I just find it really striking the number of mice you're able to acquire data from um, in this study. I know this work <laughs> can be slow. And um, I was wondering if you could comment on the team-based approach that Alan uses and how that impacts the efficiency. And if you think that neuroscience as a field would benefit from more of this team-based type of work? Yeah, um, I think there's ways in which it is, um, there's there's ways in which it really helps and then there's ways in which it maybe isn't as helpful as it sounds like it would be. Um, and so I think getting it built up took a lot of time. Um, and, um, and so I think I know a lot of academic labs that could kind of crank out these experiments while we're still kind of tr building our teams and, and training people. Um, but at the end, we end up having these, this, this nice, this pipeline, right, where we've got a team of surgeons that are really good at surgery. And so we can, every week, we know we're going to get a certain number of mice are going to enter surgery, and we have estimates of how many are going to come out, right? There's always some variables because we, there is, you know, quality control that goes in there. Um, and so it does help to have um, these dedicated teams. Um, at the same time, I think people get bored doing the same thing. And so one of the things that we've found recently is that it kind of helps to have people that bridge some of the different teams so that they're learning different skills and they're able to kind of get exposed to different aspects of the work. Um, and it, I think, improves morale and, and which in the long run, I think, improves our, our throughput and productivity. Um, so um, 
I, I do think it's 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 useful and effective, but there are some things about the pipeline where you do have to have some things very rigid, um, and it makes things hard to be flexible. Um, mm -hmm. And in a lot of academic research, you need to be able to change things very easily, um, and our system isn't really suited for that in its current iteration. I think it could be enhanced for that. Great, thank you so much. It's interesting to hear both the benefits and the challenges of that okay. type of approach. Um, we actually have one more question we'll do now, and then we'll move um, on to our next speaker after that and take the rest of the questions during the panel. But the next question is from Alex. And Alex, please feel free to unmute yourself if you'd like to elaborate on this at all. But the question is, how supportive is the Allen Institute of all the time and effort spent on that extensive documentation, tutorials, and software? Um, a common reason this kind of work doesn't get done is that it doesn't count for um, tenure in the academic system? Yeah, this is a great question. And I think a really important thing to hit on. And so part of the thing is that because this is such a fundamental part of our mission at the Allen Institute, we've got teams of software engineers whose job is developing our website, um, is developing our software kit and maintaining um, those tools, right? And so we've got people who spend time and it's part of their job to help users and to develop our tutorials. Um, and this is, I think, one of the, the challenges that I think in academic research in particular needs to start thinking about is how do we lower the barriers to um, putting data out into uh, making data openly available in accessible ways where we're not asking the, the labs that generate data to also take on this software engineering role and to take on user support roles um, because it's putting a big extra cost on the data generators and the labs that are, are, are making the data that isn't being shared equally across the, the community um, and, and is gonna slow down their progress and is gonna slow down things like tenure. Um, and so I think as a scientific community, we need to think about what are the incentives and tools that we can put in place to make this um, a lot easier and lower that burden and make it also more of the norm um, so that it becomes not only expected and, ex and accepted, but recognized and rewarded. Great, thank you. Um, yes, that similar question came up at our conference yesterday. This is a really big issue, the fact that um, data sharing is often not um, part of the tenure process. Um, okay, so we will move on to our next speaker now. Our next speaker is Dr. Lex Kravitz. All right. Great, let me... And once again, thank you, Saskia, for a great talk. Great. Are, um, okay. Are you see you're seeing my screen? Yes, we can see it. <laughs> Great. Great. Um, yes. Um, thank you uh, for everyone for tuning in and to the organizers for hosting this in this um, difficult year. So my name is Lex Kravitz. I'm an associate professor at Washington University, and the topic I'm going to discuss today um, is another uh, aspect of well, in this case, small scale data sets, but kind of visions for making them large scale. Um, and this is behavioral neuroscience. So we've, we heard from Saskia about um, 60 something thousand neurons, which is incredible. When we talk about behavioral neuroscience studies, I'll show you data that we're often talking about many fewer um, subjects and this becomes its own challenge. I have no conflicts of interest. Um, in the spirit of openness, feel free to screenshot or um, do whatever you want, share anything I'm showing, nothing's confidential. Um, and the slides themselves are available at this link. So I'll start by talking about the idealized scientific process. And I've kind of idealized it as a linear arrow, but we all know that the process often deviates from this arrow um, in many ways. And we talk about, on each of these points, we can talk about improving it and improving the rigor or the shareability of each point. The point I'm gonna talk about today is one that in behavioral neuroscience isn't talked about so much, but it's the acquisition itself. Um, and to remind you, I'm going to give you examples from my field, but um, I believe some of them are relevant beyond um, into other fields. And there's two specific challenges that I'll bring up um, that I think that, that our lab has been trying to address and address with open source methods. And the first challenge is that a lot of our acquisition is done with proprietary hardware. And that's not such a problem, but it often results in proprietary software in data formats as well, which can become much more problematic. So I've seen my share of exporting into formats, importing into other ones, or USB keys going around the lab to different computers to move things along. Um, it often ends up being a hurdle that's not really conducive to a fully um, automated or reproducible workflow. 
And then the second challenge, which I hinted at um, a minute ago, was that our results are almost always underpowered and not by a little bit. So we'll get to my opinion on why these behavioral studies are so underpowered. But first, I'm going to show you some data to make this point clear. This is a widely cited article by um, Catherine Button and colleagues, and it has a, a catchy title, Power Failure. And they talk about how most of the published work in neuroscience, and they do focus a lot on behavioral neuroscience, um, they talk about how most of this work is vastly underpowered and how it has devastating consequences for reproducibility. To look at one figure from this paper, here they analyzed, I believe it's 122 studies, um, and they found that only 15% had what they'd consider an accurate statistical, or sorry, an adequate statistical power. Um, so if there was an effect there to be discovered, um, that would say that only about 15% were powered to, to discover that effect. And to throw out some real world numbers, for a typical type of behavioral task, they, they estimated that sample size should be about 130 animals. And the median in these studies they analyzed was 22 animals, so about six-fold lower. So why don't we? Um, this got me thinking a lot. Why don't we test 130 animals in our behavioral studies? And in my opinion, the answer is that for most academic labs, this just isn't feasible. So we don't have the equipment or the time to run this type of this scale of studies. And even if someone gave us the equipment and gave us lots of money to hire people, we wouldn't have the space to house that type of an operation. So it's really our infrastructure, which is not compatible with high throughput behavioral studies. And what I'm going to show you over the next nine minutes or so is a different infrastructure um, that we can run that can allow individual researchers to run hundreds of animals in these studies. The main caveat is that this is a vision. It's an ongoing vision, um, but I'm going to show you the, so we're, I guess, so we're not quite there, but I'm going to show you the progress we've made towards this vision. And I started by asking how have other fields solved this exact same problem? So many fields at some point want to get up, scale up their throughput, and they usually turn to some combination of miniaturization and automation to do so. For example, in microbiology, the advent of the well plate, these are, these photographs are these, um, plates where, they, where individual experiments can be run, but it allows researchers to run hundreds or even thousands of experiments simultaneously on one plate. And you can see that this is a huge advance over running things in test tubes um, one at a time, which is what was going on before these plates were invented actually in the 1950s. So this has been a longstanding um, in improvement in, in microbiology. For us, we have a, a piece of equipment also invented in the 1930s, but still very much in use today, which we call the operant box or the Skinner box. It's probably in my field, one of the most widely used pieces of behavioral equipment. And the idea is that you put an animal, a rat or a mouse in the box, it can push the lever, receive food pellets. And based on how you program the box, you can learn, you can gain insight into how they learn complex tasks or how motivated they are. However, these assays take a long time. So when we, when we put an animal in these boxes, we might, move the animal into the box, have them be there for a couple hours, move them out. And when I look at the well plate, it's almost like this red line I've put where when we're done with this, we have filled up one well in the plate. And we'd have to run these around the clock for months just to fill up a plate. And I think this is really the, cus the crux of why our behavioral experiments are so underpowered. This infrastructure just doesn't support high throughput. So we started thinking about how we can solve this. This is a photo of a colony room. Um, if anyone is not familiar with rodent colonies, there are rooms like this in every university. Um, and many private companies. And what we're looking at here are four racks of cages. Each of these cages contains between one and five mice. We're looking at probably about 600 cages, about a thousand mice or so, just in this one room. So for re several reasons, including the space concerns that are um, present really everywhere, we decided that the best place to do th high throughput behavioral neuroscience studies would be in these home cages themselves. The, the cages are there, the mice are there. So we basically wanna put sensors in the cages and test an entire rack at once. Um, the vision really is, could this colony rack be like the well plate, like the 96 well plate for behavior? So this is what I'm calling a home cage vision for behavioral neuroscience. <clears throat> the idea of doing experiments in the home cage is somewhat um, distinct from many of the workflows that exist in behavioral neuroscience. But what we wanted to do is start putting sensors in. And so we started designing them and we started designing them in an open source way, mainly because we are not a company, I'm an academic lab. We felt that the open source um, way was it, it kind of distributes the manufacturer and the, and the implementation to other labs. If other people want to build it, they can simply look at the plans and build it. Um, so we made our own version of an operant box, which I'll tell you a little bit about, um, sort of the, like the box that we put the rat in, except now we made a small device that sits in the cage. 
We wanted to measure activity in the cage, so we put out sensors on the ceiling. There's a lot of inf interesting information in the environment, so not just light levels and temperature, but even some species of uh, chemicals that the mouse might produce, like carbon dioxide, can be analyzed right out of the air. And then we wanted everything, again, to be open source. This is um, obviously an interest of mine, but as me or other people come up with new ideas and new tests, we don't want that limitation where everything's been developed in some way that's really hard to access. So we wanted to make it open source so new tests could be developed and be easily integrated. And then finally, because this vision involves hundreds of cages, we need a way to connect them all. And it should be wireless because we're not going to have um, you know, that colony room that I showed you with 600 wires going into each cage. So I'm going to tell you about this vision and how far we got. The first device I'll tell you about is called Feeding Experimentation Device version 3. It's, this is our sort of small in-cage in operant device. I'll mention this is an evolution of an earlier device that was published by Katrina Nguyen in my lab in 2016. And Katrina is actually a, now a BME student here at Carnegie Mellon. So I don't know if she's on this call, but I thought that was a, a neat thing to come full circle with. This device is a wireless device. It contains a lot of hardware. It's based around a pellet dispenser, just like the classic operant box. It has nose pokes the mice interact with. Um, it has lights and tones. You can learn a lot more about it at the GitHub link, including all the design files. But really where it deviates from other solutions, from the um, sort of more traditional solutions for this, it says it's small. Um, I have one here. It's sort of small. It's designed to be placed right into a cage. And it's quite a lot cheaper. So we're building these ourselves. And I mentioned this is not really a commercial endeavor. Um, so a lot of that um, cost savings is because people are putting in the labor themselves. But it's about 20-fold cheaper than existing solutions, which I think is important if we ever want to realize this vision of improving our power in these studies by six-fold, or ideally by more than six-fold. But that would sort of get us to the minimum. This is a video of how um, of seeing it in action. This is the inside of a cage, and the mouse is just going to run over. He can poke on the left poke. The, thing, the device lights up, and it's going to dispense a pellet for him that he can eat. Um, and this can sit in there and run around the clock. We can program it in different ways to make um, to study different aspects of behavior. I'm going to show you some. This is some data from here. Here we're looking at seven cohorts of mice representing about 150 animals. And we're looking at time from zero to 16. Let me see if I. Have a. Um, this is their first. At time zero is their first time they've seen this device. At time hour sixteen, this is running overnight. They've become quite experienced with it, and we see that in all of these mice, the levels of pokes go up. In, in addition, the accuracy. So whether they're poking on the right side goes up, showing that they are starting to understand how this device works. While all of this um, 150 mice weren't run simultaneously, as I mentioned in my sort of well played analogy, um, it does show that having a cheap device like this, even in a serial way allows you to achieve the type of power um, that kind of moves you more into the high throughput behavioral studies. Because the device lives in the home cage, it also can do some other um, things that are, that are typically not done. So here we're looking at six days of data. We're looking at nose poking around the clock. And we see some, some things that are expected, like we see a nice circadian rhythm, and some things that may make you think that there's quite a lot of variance based on where in the day the animal is poking. So it really tells you about the importance of understanding if you're running the animals in the morning or the afternoon. So I could tell you a lot more about this, but in the interest of time, I want to show you one more device. Um, if you're interested in learning more, you can check out this GitHub link where um, it has all the design files. And I'm aware of about 30 labs that have built it themselves, and a few that are even now starting to modify the design, which is really um, the promise of open source dissemination, is that people not, don't just use the design you made, but actually improve it for their own use. So in the last uh, minute to two minutes, I'm going to kind of I'm going to tell you about our work transmitting this data to the cloud, and we partnered with a company called MCCI, an Internet of Things company, um, to design this, um, to kind of take us through this next step. And what we designed was an in-cage wireless device that allows us tra to transmit both environmental and behavioral data to the cloud. There's a schematic of it on the left. Um, I have a device right here, just kind of holding it. And then a photograph in a cage. We've been calling this mouse rat. And if you want to check out mouserat.org, um, you can sort of see an example of the types of data. Um, you can also reach out to me to get a little bit more in depth. But I'm going to quickly show you a, um, a tour of how this works and then tell you about the implications. I believe I'm showing you a tour. Is that running? OK, I think that. So we have these devices posting to an internet gateway. This is a semi-commercial um, slash open source 
product called Grafana that we're using, but it could go to many different dashboards. Here, what we're looking at, I'm gonna is about 30 days of data. If I zoom in on the end of, or sorry, the beginning of July, we can see both activity data and pellet data. And this is all posting in real time right out of the cages. And what I think this does, what this really does conceptually for this behavioral neuroscience is allow a place where the data can be aggregated. It's automatically backed up. It's very easy to share. I can post, give people links and they can automatically see my data and download it. Um, it also becomes a way that multiple labs could even have systems running in their own cages and post data into the same data set all very seamlessly. So the big picture, I'm gonna end here, and the big picture is this vision. Um, and I told you about a specific application in behavioral neuroscience, but I think there's a concept here of moving the reproducible pipeline one step back from the analysis pipeline and really moving it to the data acquisition itself, such that as animals complete these experiments, as they eat each pellet even, that data can be posted um, and enter analysis pipelines and even be updating conclusions um, you know, in real time. So I believe that having this um, pipeline can really facilitate reproducible, scalable, and also shareable science. I'm gonna end here. I'd like to acknowledge all the people who contributed to the work I showed. Um, the Fed3 has been something that we've been working on since Katrina Nguyen uh, made the first one in 2016, and uh, many people since then have contributed to it. Mouserat is a device that we're working on with this company, MCCI. And I'd also like to um, recognize the people or the organizations that have funded this work, um, which I'm very grateful for. I'd be happy to take questions. And certainly if you think of anything at a later date, um, you can feel free to reach out to me. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Um, really interesting talk. We actually have a question um, from Carly, who's interested in knowing if you have any thoughts about how to increase the capacity of human behavioral data that can be collected. And Carly, please feel free to unmute yourself if you'd like to elaborate or clarify that at all. So I'll mention that a lot of these devices, um, there's nothing special about a mouse. Um, so I think for a lot of the human research, I've talked with Two, with human researchers about two of these devices. Um, and I think the short answer is that absolutely they can, the whole workflow can apply to humans. I'll say quickly what those were. Um, there's a group at UNC that does human obesity work. We're, actually, we're a mouse obesity lab, so they're colleagues of mine, um, but they do imaging studies and getting sort of different types of manipulations and video game type things into their scanner um, is, can be challenging. So we worked with them to basically adapt the electronics out of this device um, you know, to something that they could use in their imaging work and also be very open. So they, you know, now they can tweak it however they want, as opposed to relying on a company. Um, it also ends up being a lot cheaper. So I think that can be a real, um, that can be a real thing that if the price comes down tenfold, it allows people to pilot with things or experiment with things, whereas they may not have 10 grand to, to drop on a company to try out a product. Great, thank you. Um, we have one more question, but I think I'm gonna save it for the panel in just a bit because it seems like it would be applicable to more than one speaker. Okay, um, okay so with that, um, we will move on to our next speaker. Thank you, Lex. Great, thank you. Okay. Our next speaker is Dr. Marina Sirota. She is currently an associate professor at the Baker Computational Health Sciences Institute at UCSF. Um, and prior to that, she worked as a senior research scientist at Pfizer, um, where she worked on developing precision medicine, medicine strategies and drug discovery. So with that, I will let you go ahead, Marina. Excellent, thank you so much. And uh, thank you so much for the invitation. Let me share my screen. Let's see, does this work? Yes. Okay, and you can see my regular view, not the presenter view, is that right? Yes, looks good. Okay. Perfect. So, um, hi everybody, my name is Marina and I'd like to tell you today a little bit about our efforts in data sharing in the context of uh, pregnancy outcomes and specifically preterm birth. So definitely shifting gears from the last two presentations, which were excellent. So uh, I always start by saying why I'm, in, I'm excited to be a computational biologist today. And some of those reasons are that there's tons of publicly available data 
uh, that we can query and analyze in different and creative ways and ask new questions about disease. And that's what my lab is focused on. And these are just some examples of those resources. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with the gene expression omnibus, which captures pretty much every transcriptomic study, microarray, RNA-seq, and even single cell RNA-seq that we have available now. Um, there's clinical data in, uh, and clinical trials data in, in databases like IMPORT. The cancer community has really figured this out really well with the Cancer Genome Atlas, which is a phenomenal resource of over 10,000 cancer samples that have been profiled with a variety of different technologies, and the data is all organized in a way that's very digestible. But nothing like this that exists for pregnancy outcomes or existed until we started working on it, and that's what I'll focus on. But also I wanted to say, in addition to the publicly available resources, people are starting to come up with creative ways to use technologies as these technologies are getting cheaper and cheaper. So transcriptomics and genomics have been around for a while, but now we can look at the antibody repertory, epigenetics, the microbiome, proteomics. And of course, many of these we can now measure at a single cell level as well, which adds a whole other level of complexity to the data. So my lab is really interested methodologically in figuring out how to integrate these diverse molecular measurements also together with clinical data that I'm not gonna talk about much today, but these are the analytical questions that we're interested in. But again, what I wanted to talk about today is our work relating to pregnancy outcomes and specifically preterm birth. For, the, for those of you who don't know, preterm birth is defined as live birth before 37th week of gestation. And worldwide, about 15 million babies are born premature every year. About a million of these infants die within the first 28 days of life. And in many cases, we don't know what was the root cause. Sometimes uh, early delivery is indicated, medically indicated, for instance, in situations like preeclampsia. But in many cases, we don't know. Uh, there's been a lot of work trying to look into various factors and mechanisms that might be associated with partuition, especially early partuition. And this is a figure from a very a comprehensive article by Roberta Romero. And it basically allows us to see the complexity of this condition. So there's many reasons why a woman might go into labor, including stress, the breakdown of the maternal and fetal immune system balance. Um, there's some mechanical issues like cervical disease or short cervix. There's vascular conditions. And of course, there's infection. And all of these are interplay in different ways. And it's really hard to understand what exactly might be a, a cause of preterm birth in a given clinical case. So to try and uh, mitigate this and study this uh, further, um, we have been asked by an organization called the March of Dimes to create a preterm birth data repository. There are currently six March of Dimes transdisciplinary centers, and these are all over the US and there's actually one in England as well. And the idea is to bring researchers from different uh, backgrounds and work on this problem of preterm birth together in creative ways. And as a result, of course, everybody generates a ton of data. So the data are very diverse. There's transcriptomics, genomics, microbiome, proteomics, immune measurements, methylation, metabolomics, so all of these different measures. And the idea was to create a repository that would allow us to house this, these omics data to enable new scientific questions, to enhance collaboration and coordination among centers, but also with a broader community and accelerate the pace of discovery. So we launched this effort in 2017, actually. So the database was launched in 2017. And we also had a paper in scientific data in 2018 describing the, the repository. So you can look at that. This is the link uh, to the repository now, but we're actually just updated and there will be a bit more information uh, um, about the new, this is actually a screenshot of the new version of the database, which is uh, completely standalone. So we have 31 studies capturing 14 different types of measurements. Uh, we have about 10,000 participants and 20,000 experimental samples. We also track the number of downloads and we can see whether people are using these data and they seem to be in the last three years, so since 2017. Uh, the type of data that's captured, I mentioned there's a number of different measurements. The majority of the data is microbiome, but we also have RNA-seq and cytop. And then in terms of the study design, 
Some of these are the individual studies, and this is the number of samples per subject. So some of the designs are longitudinal sampling and others are cross-sectional. This is what the new uh, repository looks like. So these are the various studies. You can query them and visualize them by assay type, by biosample type, so for instance, blood versus placenta versus something else, uh, which center they come from, as well as the condition. Um, the, the majority of the samples are from preterm birth, but there's also preeclampsia and other pregnancy related outcomes. Uh, there's a resource page as well. Uh, we have a clinical uh, database called using REDCap, and that one, unfortunately, because of the limitations on the clinical data, cannot be shared with the public, but it's available for the individual centers. And actually, last year, we were able to launch a dream challenge um, leveraging the transcriptomics data from the repository. Um, and this, I'll show in a second, this work is on BioArchive currently. We had a number of participants and it was actually a huge success and we're currently working on a microbiome dream challenge as well. And also we uh, have some software programs and resources uh, that we share through this resource page. This is the uh, screenshot of the BioArchive paper. Please check it out. Hopefully it'll be published soon, we're working on it. So to summarize the database piece, you know, we launched this site in 2017. Uh, these are the statistics, 31 studies, about 20,000 samples, very diverse data. We're also working on aggregating publicly available data and so far have captured 16 studies, which together add up to almost 25,000 samples. Uh, and as I mentioned before, the, the manuscript paper was published a few years ago. Okay, well, this is great, but really we wanna utilize these data and that's what my lab is focused on. And we really have taken a multi-omics approach to uh, preterm birth. These are some examples of things we've worked on. We've worked on looking at the genetics and environmental factors that might be associated with preterm birth. And these are the very talented individuals in my group who've carried out the studies. We did a microbiome meta-analysis, and this was work led by E.D. Costi, who is currently a postdoc in my group and also published earlier this year. We've done work on the transcriptomic side. I've mentioned the BioArchive Dream Challenge, but we've also done some of the transcriptomics work ourselves. That was uh, a project led by Bianca Vora and also published in Frontiers Immunology a few years ago. And then currently, we're, as I mentioned before, we're looking into that electronic medical record to see whether we can build predictive models on the medical data and actually transfer these models from one institution to another. So this project uh, that for my team, Brian Lee and Adit have been working on, uh, the idea is, was to collaborate with Vanderbilt University, build predictive models in one institution to see if we can predict women at a higher chance of preterm birth and test them in the other institution. But the story that I'd like to focus for the last few minutes and tell you guys a little bit about is actually a drug discovery story. So uh, we were interested in asking whether we can use transcriptomics data for computational drug discovery in the context of preterm birth. And the initial method, the pipeline was actually developed a number of years ago, actually as part of my graduate studies at Stanford. And what it does, it is uses a pattern matching strategy to identify new uses for existing drugs or drug repurposing. So let's say you have gene expression data from a certain disease, in our case, preterm birth, and you have gene expression data for, uh, after, before and after treatment with a certain drug. We want to link the drugs and diseases using that gene expression as a proxy. And of course, all the expression data on the disease comes from the repository that I was mentioning. So the hypothesis is if a gene uh, profile in preterm birth is reversed by a drug, then maybe that drug could be used as a therapeutic. And we've had previous success applying this pipeline to a number of different conditions, a lot of cancers, but also some autoimmune diseases as well. To identify the transcriptomic signature of preterm birth, we took a meta-analysis of three studies, and this is based on uh, the Vora et al. manuscript from 2018, and we identified 210 genes that are differentially expressed. If you see at the top of this heat map, light purple individuals are women who delivered preterm, and the individuals in dark purple are women who delivered at term. 
you can see that there's the subcluster of individuals in the middle that's enriched for, pre, for moms who delivered preterm, but this clustering is not perfect. When we looked at the pathways, we saw that a lot of immune pathways were misregulated here. So then uh, on the drug side, we leverage a data set called the connectivity map. It's a publicly available data set that contains expression from cultured human cells before and after treatment. It's a genome wide data set, so 22,000 genes, data on about 1,300 drugs, and 159 genes from our previous signature, the preterm birth signature were captured in this database. So then we go on to compute these reversal scores. So given the um, disease signature, we query the drug data. And for each one of them, we come up with a gene reversal score. And you can really think of the score as a correlation. So we want to look at the negative correlation or the drugs that might reverse the gene expression signature of the disease. And we use a rank-based approach for this. As a result, we got 83 total drug hits that were uh, significant adjusted p-value, less than 0.05, including progesterone, which is the only FDA-approved compound for preterm birth. So then we go on to um, specifically look at the drugs that are, come from pregnancy categories A and B which are the most safe, the safest FDA categories that are the safest in pregnancy. So this is a visualization of those data. And in this network, you can see that progesterone and lansoprazole, another compound, share a lot of targets, including the CYP1B1, which has been uh, previously, the mutations in this gene have been previously associated with preterm birth. There's a number of other candidates here that are interesting, including metformin, folic acid, and cotrimazole. Some of them have been investigated in animal models before. But we wanted to pick something new. So we focused on lansoprazole. So why lansoprazole? It's available over the counter. It's very safe. And one thing that we know is that it's able to induce the stress response in uh, heme oxygenase 1. Previous studies have shown that expression of HO1 has been shown to reduce pregnancy loss. And we hypothesized that targeting this mechanism might have some efficacy in preventing recurrent pregnancy loss. So we started a pilot validation study in an animal model, and this was an LPS-induced inflammation fetal wastage model, where the animals Pregnancy was uh, confirmed uh, at E0, and then LPS was induced at day 7.5. The drug treatment, both progesterone and lansoprazole, took place around that time, and at day 12 and a half, the viable fetuses were counted. We looked at three dosages of progesterone as a positive control and also lansoprazole. And then we hear the assumption, of course, none of these animal models are that representative of actual human preterm birth, but nonetheless, it's a start. So we hypothesize that prevention of this pregnancy loss in this inflammation-based model might show some potential to prevent preterm birth. So this is what the data looks like. This is the animal model uh, being induced. Uh, so we looked at just LPS, LPS plus oil and LPS plus DMSO in comparison to healthy animals. And you can see a significant reduction in the number of viable fetuses across all three groups. So of course there's a lot of biological variability. However, when we look and compare to progesterone, which is shown in blue and lansoprazole, which is shown in purple, we can see almost a complete reduction or reversal back to a normal, um, consistent number of viable fetuses with treatment with lansoprazole. And this work was done in Dr. David Stevenson's lab at Stanford University by Ron Wong and Sori Watani. So we're very excited by this work. Um, we wanted to share that with you guys as an example of ways that publicly available data can be used to actually learn something new about disease therapeutics. So as a summary, what we've done is we've built a database for preterm birth research, enabling this data sharing. And then we've used the data in the repository, uh, applying computational approaches to identify new compounds effective for preterm birth. 
we validated lab sub result, but also are looking into other candidates and also and trying to understand the mechanism of lens cell result a little bit better. With that, I would like to thank my team, uh, the folks here, Gaia, Tamiko, and Brian. So Tamiko is co-leading the database effort with me. Gaia has been doing the dream challenge work and Brian has been leading uh, the drug repurposing, as well as all of our collaborators at Stanford, the group at North of Grumman helps us with database development, the dream challenge group and the larger March of Dimes community of course, as well as March of Dimes and all of my other funding sources. This is my team. In February, we all bunched up into one elevator to go out to lunch. And of course, now we look like this on Zoom, just like everybody else. So with that, I would like to thank you for your time and I would love to take any questions. Great, thank you so much, Marina. Um, if anybody has a question for Marina, feel free to send it in chat, or you could also raise your hand and unmute yourself. Okay, I think in that case, we'll move on to the panel because we have some questions that can be- Sorry. Uh, oh, we do have questions. Sorry, I was, sorry, I couldn't un unmute myself. <laughs> sorry, I couldn't raise my hand because I'm a host. <laughs> and I couldn't uh, type fast enough, but I do have a question. So um, it's a great effort, like maintaining the, such a big integrated database and with all, all, the, uh, all the different data sources. And um, so I just wonder how much effort comes from your lab just in order to maintain the database and also to explain data to others yeah. um, when they try to use it. Absolutely, uh, that's a great question. So in terms of uh, maintenance, it's me and a senior research scientist, Tamiko, Dr. Tamiko Skotsky. Um, we, the biggest hurdle I would say is actually data curation, putting the data into the repository. And I'm incredibly lucky to partner with the Northrop Grumman team who have a lot of experience with data curation. They actually manage the import database and uh, they've been helping us with some of those efforts. So I would say, you know, more the scientific efforts are part of my team and then the back end database development and study curation, we get help from the Northrop Grumman team and we work very closely together. So for us, we identify the studies that, need to, that are interesting and relevant to be incorporated into the repository. And then we work with the PIs as well as the, um, the Northrop Grumman team to make that happen. Or for instance, when we redesigned the database, a lot of that was you know, decisions made by us together with Northrop Grumman. So we work very closely together with a technical team. And then in terms of using the data, I mean, people are using it. They sometimes reach out to us for questions, but they also probably reach out to the PIs who've generated the data. Awesome, thank you. Sure. Great, we have another question here um, and the speaker can please feel free to unmute themselves if they'd like to clarify it all. But the question is how common is this kind of drug repurposing through gene exploration? Sorry, say that again, was that for me? Sorry. Yeah. Oh, did I? Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you. I'm sorry, I missed that for a second. Okay, sorry. Oh, sorry, I think I froze. Um, the question is, how common is this kind of drug repurposing through gene exploration? So it is actually fairly common. We developed the initial method for this in 2011. And since then, it's been applied and used um, in a number of different diseases. There also is a number of startup companies that are doing maybe not exactly this sort of gene reversal um, analysis, but something similar. A lot of people use network approaches and I didn't have time to talk about this, but most recently we've actually applied this uh, to COVID-19 and we'll be presenting that at the ASHG conference in a plenary session actually next week. So I think it, there are situations where you want to repurpose drugs and figure out, a, you know, a, a good and you know consistent way to do that. And this is a way to generate the, those hypotheses. Of course, there needs to be additional testing, both animal model testing, and also, of course, clinical trials to show efficacy. But because these drugs are FDA approved, um, there is a little bit 
less of a burden on um, uh, showing safety. I don't know if that answers the question. Great, and we have one more question for you and then we will move on to our panel. Um, Irene, if you'd like to unmute yourself, I'll just let you go ahead and ask your question. Sure. Hi, Marina. Great to see you. Hey, good to see you. That was great. I was wondering, you when you put up the interaction network, you showed that progesterone and lensoprazole were interacting with a lot of the same proteins. But it seemed like from your results that lensoprazole actually worked better than progesterone. So I was wondering if you've thought about, you know, do you think they're working through the same mechanism and what differences there might be? That's a great question. We haven't tested the mechanism, but despite the fact that they share some targets, they don't share all the targets. And then the other point is that the reversal score from la for lansoprazole is considerably better than progesterone. Right. So that, that's why we were excited to try it because it was something new, hasn't been tried in the context of preterm birth. But also we had at least some evidence that maybe it's doing something relevant, but maybe it's doing more. But the mechanism is something that we really need to investigate. And one area that we're exploring now, actually in collaboration with um, Gary Nolan's uh, uh, group and site of uh, techniques is looking at um, specifically human cells and what these drugs do in human cells. So let's say we have blood from a pregnant woman and we look at the immune measurements before and after treatment with a compound to really try and understand the mechanism beyond what we can see in cancer cell lines, which is the data that we use for prediction. So absolutely, we definitely want to look into that. It just haven't gotten there yet. Cool, thanks. Sure. Okay, at this point, I'm going to invite Lex um, and Saskia back to our virtual stage here for a panel conversation with Marina. Um, and we actually had a question that came in for Lex earlier, but it's possible our other speakers would like to share their thoughts on this as well. Um, Eric, if you are here, you can just Meet yourself and ask Lex directly. Hi, and, and thanks everyone. Uh, uh, my question, I, I guess, is really applicable to everyone. Um, for Lex specifically, how does the sharing of the data acquisition, the, the step you added at the end, um, how, in real time or not, how does that really improve? your science or science in general? And I guess to the, the panel, um, if you could uh, help make it clear just what the openness of, of your approaches really adds for you, uh, that'd be really appreciated. Yeah, I'll, um, I'll go first on that one. Um, so I assume you're talking about the posting things in real time. How does that improve the science? Yep, <laughs> so the, the when you getting to think about a hundred mice in a group or something, when we do things with other methods, whether it's moving USB keys around or copying files and thing, you start to run into a bottleneck pretty, pretty quickly. Once you get to about a dozen, it gets annoying if you're doing anything manual. So I think that pushing a hundred at once to a database that's there is kind of a critical step for doing anything high throughput without kind of going crazy and having a lot of human error and moving it around. I think it also has a lot of, it opens up the possibility, which we have not yet realized, but it does open up the possibility for things like multi-site studies. So instead of me doing an experiment and saying, hey, here's what I think is a good approach, I might call you and we could have the same equipment sending it into the same database or ideally, you know, um, six or seven sites, which is something that's pretty routine in clinical studies that they synchronize across sites and almost non-existent in our rodent behavioral world. Um, so I think there's some, some things are just kind of convenience right now, but then there's some more visionary things that you could imagine, or I would hope come to pass in the future. I'll chime in. I think kind of the broader question that you're asking, Eric, is, is really, um, is really important and really interesting, right? Like how does, how does making data open affect the science that we're doing? Um, and in, in many ways, I think largely it, it doesn't, right? Like if, if we're being asked by publishers to share our data and so we share our data, like great, um, but it doesn't necessarily change anything about 
the way we do science or, um, or what comes out of it. And so I think this is kind of one of the questions that I think as a scientific community, we should think a little bit more about because otherwise we're just creating a lot of big data files that are taking up a lot of space to maintain and you know to store somewhere. Um, and so what is that big advantage? And one of the things that we've talked about as a, as a community is like the reproducibility crisis. Um, I'm, I'm not even convinced it really solves that, but I think it, it could, right? I think we could have some places where by sharing the data, we come to understand more about, for instance, quality control. Um, and maybe people that are trying to use my data that run into particular issues might bring to light some of the you know, some problems that might come through how we've processed the data or how we've collected the data that then allows us to kind of improve on that iteratively um, or better understand some of these processes. Um, so like, I do think that there's, there is some benefit and space for that. Um, but I think until data reuse becomes a norm, it's not going to have a big impact on, on the science. Um, it's, it's just gonna be a way to kind of validate that we've done things you know, we're, we're playing by the rules. Um, and so I think there does need to be a, a bit more of a cultural shift, um, at least in the data modalities that I work in, in terms of um, what it really means to share that data and for that to really have an impact in the, in the, for the science. I will say one more thing that I think we experience is often it takes a long time. There's a long lag between acquiring the data and getting to the part where you've made a conclusion. And by the time you get to where you're, you know, you have your answer, so much time has passed. Often the experiment cannot can no longer be changed. You can do a new experiment. So if we could shorten that lag time to where certain metrics can be pulled out even the same day as the experiment or right away, it could allow things to turn around a little more quickly um, and kind of speed up the increase the speed that of um, of doing new things. I'm thinking about for us with the mice. The ideal is that you don't have to then start with a whole new group of mice. You know, maybe things that you could realize, okay, we have one more experiment to do and we realized it this afternoon, as opposed to two weeks or two months later, when then you're kind of back investing new resources. Great. And Marina, do you have anything you'd like to add to that? I mean, I think I think the other panelists have covered it pretty well. Okay, great. Are there any other questions? Um, you can send me a question in the chat or just also raise your hand. I'm just gonna give this a minute to see what's coming through. Oh, okay, we do have a question here um, from Alex. Alex, please go ahead and unmute yourself. Hi, I'm sorry, my husband is also in a conference behind me, so that <laughs> no worries. may um, generate a little extra noise, but um, my, um, my question was about the um, about all the, the videos and stuff. I guess this is it's, it's sort of overlapping with the last questioner, which was about what's the reuse potential? I'm, I'm curious because you mentioned other researchers maybe are downloading your videos and using them, but it seems like that research is really specific. So uh, as a librarian, I'm wondering what is the reuse case there? Because it's something that I'm asked fairly often when I advocate for data reuse and specifically because I'm interested in microscopy and things like that. Um, people are like, well, is anybody really going to reuse other people's microscopy images or things like that? Um, and then the other question I had that's related is um, for data where it's non-tabular, for data where it's actually photos or videos, that's potentially copyrightable. And I'm wondering if you have dealt with licensing issues at all around that fact. <laughs> it's not potentially copyrightable. It's automatically under copyright in the US at least. So I can speak a little bit for um, for our data. So the the reuse case for the movies for us um, is that the the methods for extracting the um, identifying cells and extracting their activity um, is is an area of active research. Um, this image processing. Um, stage. Um, and so, you know, when we started actually our pipeline, there were no, um, 
there, there were no available methods for that. And if you looked at the literature, um, the way that people were doing that was manually, right? Where a graduate student was was looking at the movie and you know using image J to draw um, some sort of polygon around putative neurons. Um, and there are now a few software packages that have come out, um, but there is no single standard in the field. Um, the different packages, you know, will yield somewhat different results. Um, and so it's an area of active research that a lot of people are, are, are still working on um, and probably will be for a while. And so, you know, we maybe don't need 1500 hours of movies available for people to continue working on that, but having some movies available is definitely um, really valuable for that effort so that, um, people can benchmark the different methods on a, say, the, a single data set, um, for instance, or compare it to their own da data sets, right? Because every microscope is, is a little bit different. Um, and so seeing how robust it is to different imaging pathways and things like that is, is useful. Um, so that's the big use case for our, um, for our movies um, that we know about and that we know several people that are using it in that way. Um, the, Question about copyright, I honestly don't know. Um, we have like a legal team that deals with the licensing. And again, this is where like being at a place where this is part of our core mission makes it a little bit easier for me as a researcher to not have to think about it because um, I just forward anything to the legal team and they deal with it. So, but that's a, a good point to bring up. Anyone else have any thoughts on that? Okay, um, we have time for probably another question. If anybody would like to raise a hand or put a question in the chat. Could I ask a quick one to Saskia? Um, so when you doing everything in house allows you to do a lot of things really, it streamlines a lot of things. Um, do you have any plans to allow external people to contribute to these repositories? Um, we, we don't. Um, I think it's, it's a, a really kind of a great idea. Um, and I think, um, I mean, in many ways, like what it doesn't need to kind of go through somebody, it doesn't have to go through say the Allen Institute to do that, right? Um, as there are new repositories for this type of data, um, that's essentially serving that purpose, right? Um, and I think the thing there is, I think the challenge is is making sure the data, well, I guess, I don't know that you need to make sure, but I think it's the quality control step, right? Where people are generating data and for it to kind of, be usable, you either need to know that it meets some certain standard of quality control or have quality control metrics kind of embedded in the data, um, included in, in the data so that users are able to assess that themselves. And I think um, that's kind of an important thing um, for considering alongside metadata and documentation is, is having kind of those kind of agreeing on some standards for, for QC uh, for, for a given data modality. Um, but yeah, we don't necessarily, we don't currently have any visions for that ourselves. Um, but I, I think it's a great area. And I think as more repositories develop, so for instance, Dandy is the is a NIH repository for physiological activity. I think there's opportunities to, to kind of create a more robust um, centralized data set like that. So. Cool, thanks. And I think I saw another question. Brian, do you have a question? If so, you can. Unmute yourself. Um, sure, yeah. I, um, Lex was basically going to ask your question to you in that wouldn't it make just as much sense to coordinate these massive cohorts of, you know, whatever your experiment is um, across labs as opposed to trying to have one lab do everything? So yeah, I think in that's sort of the vision, and I think it'd be great to come to a vision where you could imagine a, you know, a group of people that decide, um, you know, this is a good experiment to be done, and we're going to all pool resources and and generate a really high quality data set, um, kind of like what the Allen Institute is doing in various ways. But if you could imagine, no, no academic lab could do that, but maybe ten of them could together, 
um, come up with. So I think that would be great. I think we need a lot more infrastructure to get there. Um, so I kind of imagine to keep working on these types of things and keep pushing them. And somewhere along the line, I'm hoping there's a point where I could say, hey, you know, we can coordinate now that enough people are sort of posting data in real time. What if we all tried to send it into one database um, and come up with an experiment that we all agree is an important step to do in a distributed way? Um, so, yeah, I feel like these are the baby steps to getting us there. Awesome. Thank you. And I believe Wajin had a question. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, so I guess now I'm, I'm wearing my librarian's hat here and asking this question. So I, um, I guess a while ago I worked with uh, some librarians to come up with the data curation primer for microscopy data, just, you know, tell the, uh, teach the data curators in the repositories how to, what do you look for when you uh, take in this data, what's the minimum requirement and what's the, like the best practices. So my question is, what, how, how do you, first is, do you think this type of effort is valuable uh, in terms of your specific data? Um, and also, what more can we do? So I can say that curation efforts are incredibly important for the data sharing efforts that I'm leading because if the data is not well curated, it won't be, other people will not be able to use it very well. So actually there's a lot of time that's being put in, in my case with the Northrop Grumman group curating our data sets. So I guess I want to add more, a little more to, to, our, to my question is like often like librarians uh, are not necessarily uh, familiar with the data you're uh, working with, right? So how do we like work, um, do better, I guess? That's a good question. I mean, understanding the assumptions of the data and how and working very closely with the PIs or the whoever on the team are managing data to get it into a format that it's, is usable is something that we spend quite a bit of time on. I don't know if that answers your question, but for sure, I think it's, it's critical. Yeah, I agree. It's absolutely critical. And it's probably a place where there needs to be a tight partnership between the scientists and in, in your case, librarians or, or in other cases, software engineers. But I think there definitely needs to be kind of a tight collaboration, at least in establishing that process. And maybe once it's established, it can kind of um, can continue on. But um, I think that's one of the places we put it, a lot of energy into that kind of gets overlooked um, is that that curation, that curation step. So. Okay, well, if anybody, um, anybody have anything else to add to that? Okay, great. Well, we're just about time anyway, um, but thank you so much, um, Saskia, Lux, and Marina. Thank you. Um, about your work with data sharing and these large data sets. It's really fascinating.